I will introduce our speaker, Dr. Bradford Wiles. He works with Kansas Extension as well as Early Childhood Development at Kansas State University. He is a researcher, a lecturer, all-around great guy. Even though it, he is a Hoosier, I'm from Illinois, so there's a bit of a, an issue between us and that. <laughs> Brad's originally from Noblesville, Indiana. He grew up on, the small, on a small farm where his parents still live and was a 10-year 4-H member. After graduating from Noblesville High School, he earned a Bachelor of Science in Psychology at, at Indiana University, Bloomington in 97. Bradford enjoys all manner of outdoor activities, including fishing, hiking, canoeing, and kayaking, flying kites, astronomy, fossil hunting, playing any sport he can, especially golf. He is happiest when spending time with his daughter, Hannah Rose, his son, Hunter James, and his wife, Danielle. In addition to his love of the outdoors, Bradford loves all things involving music. As a multi-instrumentalist, he loves playing just about any kind of music. He currently is proficient in guitar, acoustic, electric, and resonator, bass, drums, harmonica, ukulele, and all sorts of percussion. Bradford also has a small recording studio where he serves as recording engineer, mixer, ma mixer master, equipment modification, and repair technician, even, take, even as the talent. A few things beyond his family make him happy as he is when playing, recording, or listening to music. And have an IndyCar fan, Bradford has not missed an Indy 500 since he began attending those with his father in 1983. So with that, I will turn it over to our dear friend Bradford. Thank you, Chris. Um, so, yeah, uh, I have a little, little asterisk there, and I'll get to that in just a minute. So, uh, I start because this is by far my favorite introduction to the Indy 500. Oh, Nobody talked about your chances to win the Indy 500. Did you think you had a chance? <laughs> no, not really. You know, Michael had us covered all day, and uh, and the Lola, the Ford Lola Cosworths just outrun us bad all day. And so, you know, the best we could do is was best in class. And uh, there's a lot of sounds like there's for. there sounds like there's some tears in your voice right now. Well, you just don't know what Indy means. <laughs> So that's uh, that's Ellinger Jr. He won twice. Uh, his father won four times. His uncle won three times. And he means a lot. So uh, I'll give you an overview of my talk. I'll just talk a little bit about my personal background. I'll give you some of the milestones in the, in the history of IMS. So when I say IMS, that is the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It's big. Um, and then the Indianapolis 500 mile race. Um, I started at the track in 83. I'll go through the 80s, some of the milestones and memories. Um, I'll talk about some more, some of the facts, the 90s, uh, the split, um, and then uh, some of the other cool stuff that happened. Um, and then what comes next? So, um, to start, so I was born in Indianapolis. Gordon, excuse me, Gordon Johncock won that year which is important. Um, in central in Indiana, we do not refer to it as the Indy 500. We don't call it anything other than the race. If you say the race, everybody knows what you mean. Very simple. Uh, lots of car culture there. All of the Indy car teams call Indianapolis their home. Uh, lots of research and development, lots of engineering that goes on there. Um, even though I went to Indiana, Purdue University is north of us. It's a very well-respected engineering school. As much as I hate to say that, it is true. Um, and uh, so there's a real culture of collaboration in engineering and technology. And then they've started to really incorporate some of the arts components into it, into the livery. Um, and so all of these things are sort of the, the embodiment of science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, right? So when you see some of these things, recognize that so much of what you're seeing are these iterative components of technology development. And some of them work better than others. So uh, the first time, the last time that I only had to listen to the radio, um, it was Rick Mears and Gordon Johncock, and I will play a clip of that. Um, and then, of course, the first time was 83. And then, every year I find a way to be, quote, back home again in Indiana, end quote. Everybody know what I mean by back home again in Indiana? So Jim Neighbors, 
for those of you who don't know Jim Neighbors, Gomer Pyle sang back home again in Indiana for about 40 years. Um, and then he uh, couldn't do any more and then uh, passed away. But now a guy named Jim Cornelison, who's an Indiana grad, uh, who also sings the national anthem at Chicago Blackhawks games, gets to do it. Um, I will admit that I tear up every time that I'm at the track and hear this. It's, it's very, very special. Uh, I have lived in Florida, Colorado, California, Virginia, Kansas, Honduras, and Ghana, and always made my way back. I will go on a sabbatical to Norway this coming year. It will start in June. It will end in early May. <laughs> so, this is, uh, this is the 82 Indy 500. This is the radio call. That wildcat fly as Gordon Johncock is leading the pair. He got him on the back stretch and he's leading him into the first turn. And he's building up on that lead. Gordon Johncock in car number 20, the STP oil treatment special. Rick Mears and then Tom Stevens, they hit in the turn two. The crowd on their feet here in turn three. Mears just can't get around Gordon Johncock. He shut the door again, got the horsepower up, and he's leading going into four. For those of you who thought it was going to be a runaway for Rick Mears, I guarantee you it is not. Gordon Johncock is able to stay ahead right. of Mears. So, Here comes Rick Mears. so they have to pit, the pit right? Mears There's three laps to go. He runs into that guy, right? So I'm going to pause here. Whoops, sorry. I'm going to pause there. First, innovations. One of the things is you can't speed down pit lane anymore. Did you see how fast they were going? They were going about 120 miles an hour down pit lane. Now, 60 mile an hour limit. Okay. Also, if you run in the back of someone, you get penalized. In the 80s, that wasn't the case. So I'll go back to that. Sorry, you had to see the... The rest of that, okay, and then I'm going to get us to, at least I thought I was going to get us to, all right. That wildcat fly right. as Gordon and Johncock is leading the pair. He got him on the back stretch, and he's leading him into the first turn. Right. And he's uh, building up on that lead. Gordon Johncock in car number 20, the STP oil treatment special. Rick Mears and then Tom Stevens, they head into turn two. All right, right. sorry that it's... Just can't get around Gordon Johncock. He shut the door again, got the horsepower up, and he's leading going into four. All right. For those of you who thought it was going to be a runaway for Rick Mears, I guarantee you it is not. Gordon Johncock is able to stay ahead of Mears. Here comes Rick Mears down into the pit area. Mears has to lock the brakes up. He almost rear-ended a car that was slowing in the pits. Now Mears screams. Almost. The pit area of Chuck Harlow. <laughs> he is just They've got to get enough to finish this race. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Now the horse is around. He's on his way. John Cox screams through the fourth turn. Comes off the fourth and heads down for the pit. Right, so, got, so John Cox has to pit too, right? John Cox would like to get past him in the pit. Look at how fast he's going. John Cox makes a pass of Jim Hickman in the pits, and now John Cox breaking to a stop, locks the wheels up. Let's go down to Lou Palmer. They are making a small adjustment now. George Hooning taking the signal from Gordon to the front end. They're setting their handling characteristic for their final 20 laps. There he goes. At the Indy 500 for every second that you wait, it's three football fields. Maybe of their decade, Gordon could be on his way to another win. Here's Gordon Johncock, but not too far behind him is Rick Mears. Rick has got the pedal to the metal, as they say. He's trying to catch Gordon Johncock. Can he do it? Johncock flashes by me, and there's Rick Mears right behind him as they head into number three. He may be able to see that blue and white. Gold charge in his rear view, Mears. Johncock had to go to the inside to get around traffic. Mears is getting closer. He is getting much closer. It's going to be a shootout. Johncock moves through the turn. There goes Rick through the turn. And we've only got three more laps to go. All right, so there's Mears in the back. Now there's no cars between them. And see how far away they are. Mears, one and a half seconds behind Johncock. Run. All right, and a tremendous battle right here. There's Gordon Johncock. There's Rick Mears. It's just that close as they have the second turn. Johncock can really see Mears in his rearview mirror. The crowd on their feet. They're cheering. They want Mears to catch him and have it a foot race right to the checkered flag. Now the distance is less than half the short shoot. It isn't going to be long before Rick Mears will be right up on the bumper of Gordon Johncock. They're in the straightaway. It's a battle to the 
finish as we're watching John Cock lead Bears across the line. 198 laps complete, five miles to go. And here's Gordon John Cock. Mears now about eight car lengths behind as they accelerate off of turn number two. Mears is right on the rear wing of Gordy John Cock as they dive into turn three. They're getting down to the nitty gritty. They've got one car in front of them. They're in the short shoot. And here they come. John Cock maintains the lead. Rick Mears way low in the turn. He may make a move here on the straightaway as the white flag comes out. And Mears is right there. The white flag. It's a drag race. They're side by side. John Cock and Mears. Mears on the inside. John Cock, Mears forced down the little line. Run. John Cock cuts him off. Now Gordy pulls away a little bit as Mears gets a little squirrely in turn number two. They're on the back stretch. It's still Gordon John Cock. Mears is trying, but he's about 10 car legs behind. Here they come. This is the final quarter lap. John Cock maintains the lead. The voice of the 500, Paul Page. Who's going to win it? Gordon John Cock off the fourth turn. Mears is right behind him. John Cock. Mears makes the try. John Cock wins it by less than one tenth of a second. Gordon. So Gordon John Cock won that year. One of his two. Um, that's important to me because I became a Rick Mears fan that day. Um, so a few things about the, about the race itself. First, the first use of a rear view mirror was in the inaugural race. Ray Haroon drove first the only car that only had one driver, no mechanic. And because of that, the other drivers were very scared that he was going to wreck them because the mechanic was supposed to serve as your eyes. Well, he clearly overcame that. Um, uh, winners drink milk because Louis Meyer, who was a dairy farmer, drank milk, buttermilk. By the way, if you've ever had buttermilk on a hot May day in Indiana, I don't recommend it. Um, it is the world's largest single day sporting event. Um, it was originally called the, the International 500 Mile Sweepstakes Race. Uh, if you win, you get your bust on the Borg Warner Trophy and they give you a little tiny one. Um, they call him a baby Borg. Uh, Janet Guthrie was the first of 10 women to compete in the race. Um, Eddie Cheever still holds the record um, from 1998, the fastest lap during the race. Um, and it is one of the three crown jewels of motorsport. One of them is the name of this room, the Monaco GP, and the other, of course, is the 24 Hours of Le Mans. So, um, facts about the Brickyard. It was built in 1909. It's called the Brickyard because there were 3.2 million bricks. Um, it was built for motorcycles. Uh, you heard them talk on the video about short shoots. So those are the areas between the turns on an oval like that. It's, it's like a rectangular oval, and I'll show you in just a second. Uh, permanent seating is around 260,000. So it'll hold more than 400,000. Um, and now, to call it the brick yard, <laughs> there's a yard, three feet of bricks, at the start-finish line. And all the drivers kiss the bricks now if you win. This is one of my favorite demonstrations of how big the Speedway is. You can fit Yankee Stadium, the White House, the Rose Bowl, the Roman Coliseum, Liberty Island, Vatican City, Churchill Downs, and the Taj Mahal all in there, and you still have some room to spare. It's big. So we'll start in the 80s. Uh, Tom Sneva won. He won from fourth place. An important part of this, too, is that Tom Sneva was sponsored by Skoll. You see Emerson Fittipaldi, sponsored by Marlboro. You don't see that anymore, right? They're not allowed to advertise. So that took some money out of, uh, out of the IndyCar series. Um, Al Unzer Sr. and Little Al became the first father-son to compete against each other. Um, Rick Mears won his second in 84. Danny Sullivan and Mario Andretti, I'll show you a quick clip of that, a quick one this time. Um, and in 87, Al Unzer became the second four-time winner. A.J. Foyt was the first. Um, in 87, Al Unzer Sr. did not have a ride. Um, Penske driver Danny Ungaius was not cleared to race, so literally three days before qualifications, Unzer got in the car, he won the race, became the 
uh, second four-time winner. Um, Rick Mears won again in 88, and then Emerson, Paul, Emerson Fittipaldi and Little Al. This is right there, and I'll, I'll give you just a quick glimpse of both of those. So here's my Danny Sullivan clip. Alongside Mario Andretti, it's a drag race down the main stretch. Can Sullivan pull Andretti into the first turn, Ron Carroll? Sullivan, it is. Danny Sullivan gets him. Danny Sullivan gets him. Da no, he's squirrely. No, he's spinning. Danny Sullivan spins, but he goes around twice and gathers it. In. Absolutely incredible. Danny Sullivan spun in front of Mario Andretti, gathered the car back up and continues on, and Sullivan only fell back to second place. He goes on to win that race. He was going about 220 when he spun around there. He's a good driver. And now Ammo has a lap and a half. Here we go. Here, Here he goes Demo past. on the inside. Here comes oh. Demo. Oh, he blocks him down low. Demo and didn't they're like still that. side by side going into Emerson, turn three. Emerson, little Al. Low in the middle of the track, and Ammo may have it. They almost touch oh, wheels. Oh, they, they do touch. touch wheels. And into the wall is Al Jr. Ammo continues on. They touch wheels in turn three. Ammo. Sorry, that's quite loud. Um, so something about little Al that you need to know there is that he got out of his car, he was fine, walked over to the edge of the track where the cars are going by at yellow, gave Emerson a round of applause, thumbs up, respected his racing. These guys like each other, they race each other, they, they appreciate competition. They were going for the win. I mean, that was like two laps to go, right? Going for the win, limited amount of real estate, Sometimes it happens. But as you saw starting out, little Al gets his. All right, some of the innovations in the 80s. So ground effects. In 1980, that was the first time that ground effects came. Uh, so using aerodynamics to hold the car to the ground, right? Um, so you see this, there's a little tab on the back here that's called the gurney tab. Uh, that little bit there was, it was invented around the 60s by Dan Gurney, tremendous engineer, um, and it provides uh, a tremendous amount of additional downforce. Um, and so for those of you not really used to racing, downforce keeps the car on the track, but it compromises speed because you have more drag, right? So there's always this balance between how much downforce you have and how fast you can go. You want it right in the sweet spot where you can have the pedal all the way to the floor and it's barely hanging on. Now just imagine going 235 miles an hour and barely hanging on. I, I've only gone 180 on the track and that was enough. Um, one of the real key inventions though is that they started using carbon fire, what they called tubs. Um, the injuries to drivers in their extremities used to be really, really severe when they would wreck. So you saw little Al go into the fence. Um, they had the, t the carbon fiber tubs. Before that, there wasn't enough strength in the cars themselves to prevent really bad injuries below. Uh, they also started using fuel cells and then breakaway fittings so that as soon as the pressure was gone, the, the fittings would cut off so that fuel wouldn't go sprayed everywhere. One of the things is they used ethanol gas. You can't see it. Hard to put out fires when you can't see the flames. Um, and then finally, they did, they did a, a whole lot of engine development in the 80s. Okay, in the 90s, 1991, Rick Mears wins his fourth. So now he's the, the third four-time winner. In 1992, that was the closest finish in Indy 500 history. I'll show you a quick clip of that. Um, note that this is in 1996. Still the fastest four lap average for qualifying. Now he did not get the pole because of the way that qualifying works. I won't go into it, but at Indy qualifying is two weekends. And if you're on the second weekend, you can't get the pole position. Uh, or at least that's the way it was in the 90s into the 2000s. Okay, uh, does, every, does anybody know what I'm talking about when I, when I say the split? Okay, so open wheel racing in North America was the biggest motorsport in the 90s, without question. But what was starting to happen there is what you see in Formula One, which is 
really big teams were pouring millions of dollars into their enterprise to get a tenth of a second. And it was really pushing out any smaller teams. And you'll see, you see this in Formula One often. One team dominates, and, all, and then the rest are kind of also rans. And then something shifts, and then it's one team that dominates. Right now, it's uh, Red Bull. Uh, the previous several years, it was Mercedes. And before that, it was McLaren, or Ferrari. Before that, it was McLaren, right? So it got really untenable, and it got really ugly. And what happened? They split into CART and Indy, or Indy Racing League, and then they reunited in 2008, but NASCAR filled the gap, right? Um, I have many things to say about NASCAR, but my mother told me not to say anything if I couldn't say anything nice. So um, this is the closest finish. Scott Gidier started 33rd, last. Sweeney's white flag, two and a half miles, one more lap to go. If Scott Goodyear has a chance, the time is now. Don't forget 10 years ago, John Cox and Rick Mears raced on the last lap for the finish. John Cox won that one. That was experience over Rick Mears, relative inexperience. Will that happen again here today? They're on the back stretch. 223 miles an hour on the last lap. No traffic involved. They make the turn for home now. On the main stretch, Scott Goodyear closes in. He looks for a place to come by. Scott Goodyear tries it, but no. I believe that's the closest finish in Indy history. Closer than the race 10 years ago with Gordon Goff, John Cock beat Rick Mir. 10 years ago when Little Al was new to this track. And now, Al Unser Jr. is a winner at the Indianapolis 500. That was the most fabulous finish I've ever seen. I've never seen anybody try any harder than Scott Goodyear did or Little Al. They zigzagged all over the racetrack, did everything they could to mess each other up or whatever that you try to do. That was uh, Bobby Unser on the call, Little Al's uncle. He did his best to be impartial. It's tough when it's your nephew. Um, but uh, let's, let's uh, hold on, let me, yeah, okay, so let's move into the 2000s. So this is the safer barrier. So this is one of the most important innovations in all of motorsport. Um, it is designed so that when you hit this wall, which does happen from time to time, this is all foam here. So this is steel, this is foam, and it compresses. But most importantly, it's really easy to replace. So when you have a yellow flag, a crew can go out and replace it very rapidly and be assured that if someone hits the wall at the same point, it's okay. And it is much, much safer for the drivers, right? Uh, one thing I noticed is on the radio call, like he said, uh, 223 average, that's average. So they have to slow down in the turns, but when they're going on the, straight, on the main stretches, uh, during that time, they were probably going about 235. Right, about, right now, they're going about 240, 241. Um, important milestone in the Indy 500 in 2005. Danica Patrick led 19 laps. I can tell you, pandemonium at the Speedway. It was very, very cool being there. Um, it, was, it, was, it was really, really cool. Uh, she ended up finishing fourth. Uh, which was definitely the best. And then Dan Weldon won. Um, he walked around with t-shirts saying, I won the Indy 500, but nobody cared. <laughs> um, and then Dario Francretti won in 2007. And I say that because, well, in the 2010s, Francretti um, won two more times. So he's a three-time winner. Um, in 2011, Dan Weldon won again. Uh, tragically, Dan died at Las Vegas later that year. Um, 
I'll show you Frankini and Sato's battle. And in 2014, so look at this, look at the 2010s. We had the 100th anniversary, we had the second close race ever, um, and then we had the 100th running. The reason that we had the 100th anniversary and the 100th running is that World War I, World War II, the race was not run. It's not that they wanted, didn't want to, it's that they needed rubber and steel and gas for the war. Um, so, uh, Alex Rossi, this was a, a really interesting race. Um, he won on fuel. So you saw Mears and Johncock having to pit with two laps to go. Well, Alex didn't have to pit. He ended up crossing the finish line on the last lap going about 179 miles an hour, which is a snail's pace when cars are going 50 miles an hour faster than you. Uh, but he was able to do it. It was great uh, strategy, right? So this is, you know, I, I hope getting to some of the, the key parts of, of the 500 is it's not just how fast you can go, it's all the things that you plan and what happens, what other teams decide to do, all right? So this is the second closest finish. I want you to, to note who's in second here as well. Turn is right on the heels now of Elio Castroneves. Marco Andretti not letting those front two get out of his sight. Ryan Hunter Ray looking at Elio Castroneves making that car plenty wide. Touch right into Hardy. Almost got into the grass to make the pass. Ryan Hunter Ray with a five time move in the exit to three. Back in front of Indianapolis. At 197, Hunter Ray is in front. Castroneves trying to hold up Andretti. The Andretti car of Hunter Ray leads it in. An incredibly brave move, a dart that gave Ryan Hunter Ray the lead. Castro Nevis is moving outside. And he sits outside and can't lift the move. Ryan Hunter Ray, eight car lengths in front, is a move in the back stretch for the final time. And Elio makes the move, three laps too early. Does he have anything at all left in the tank? A couple of turns to go. Ryan Hunter Ray leads it in. Turn number 800 is upon him. Less than a car length is the difference. The final turn, Hunter Ray to call the finish. The voice of the 500, Paul Ray. And it is Ryan Hunter Ray that is going to lead Elio Castro Nevis across the line. Ryan Hunter Ray has his first Indianapolis 500 mile race win. Elio Castro Nevis will have to wait for another year to get his fourth Off victory the at the Indy. All right, so Elio finishes second. He's done that a few times. All right, this is, one of, this is one of the coolest, at least for me, demonstrations of the safety of the cars as well as the level of competition. He's attacked the third. Takuma Sato now in the second place. He has split up that target party. Can Takuma Sato be the one to take the Ford Warner Trophy? Mark James to you. Takuma Sato trying to reel in the number nine machine of Dorio Frankini is the exit turn number three. It is Takuma Sato about a 10 car length disadvantage now. He's in second. He is behind the leader, Dorio Frankini, looking for win number three. The white flag is out. Takuma Sato, the Ray Hall Letterman of the Lanigan driver, now pulling up on the leader. Dorio Frankini, will he make the move? No, he'll crash in turn number one. Jake Perry, Sato crashes, trying to make the pass for the lead on the final lap of the race. Dario Franchini got through that, and Takuma Sato did. A couple of things. You saw how we went around, right? So again, they're fighting for the same real estate. Goes around, don't want to hit with the back of your car. The engine's back there. It typically will shove into your cockpit. The carbon fiber tubs made a difference. They also put all kinds of safety things on there so that when things fly off the car, they don't actually fly off. They're tethered now to the car so they don't come and hit the driver, particularly the wheels, um, which is some really, really cool engineering. Um, and then... Um, the year, here comes J.R. Hildebrand, this time by the white flag is in hand. So this is 2011. And this is where the Indy 500 will get you. The 23-year-old from Sausalito, California. Listen to the crowd cheer him on. And how fitting for the National Guard car to win if he can indeed do that. If he got enough fuel to make it to the end. Half a lap. He's got half a lap to go and he's the Indy 500 champion. Panther Racing, oh so good. They finished second here. Twice here they come again. 
through the final two corners. J.R. Hildebrand. Careful of traffic. He's got to get around the lap. Traffic. 100 years now. Oh, no. He hit the wall. Oh, Just my like Tommy goodness. Shaker. Keep Just your like foot Shaker. on the gas. Dan Weldon is going to win the race. That is unbelievable. Oh, my goodness. Weldon, after finishing second the last two years, wins when J.R. Hildebrand hits the wall coming out of four, just as Schechter did. What? So, yeah. Imagine you're about to win the Indy 500, right? The biggest race in the world, if you're, particularly if you're an Indy driver. Can't get around slower car, put it into the wall. He did finish second because he coasted all the way down the main stretch. But Dan Weldon is a really interesting story, too. He finished second the two years before, um, one of the most liked drivers. And uh, again, he was, he was uh, killed tragically. Um, so importantly, though, I want to show you this because now I do want to say about going to the races, the crashes are spectacular. Anybody who really likes going to the race, you don't want to see him, right? It's, it, it, first, it slows the race down, but also, you know, you just never know what's going to happen there. And, um, you know, you just you want everybody to be safe. It's much more fun when it's safe. So this is Scott Dixon right there. Let's take a look here. Give you a few different angles at it here. nothing Scott can do here. He comes off. Scott's just trying to go. You know, you don't, you don't see that car up against the wall when you're right behind someone. Lands right on the side of the tub. You see all the debris going. Right? Even the tire comes off there and goes down because it was that violent. And there's Scott walking away from that. Walks away. Seven-time IndyCar Series champ. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's really impressive, the, the safety uh, component. So then, the last couple of years, um, in 2020, the race was held without spectators. Um, it was also the first time that wasn't on Memorial Day weekend. However, the Speedway president, Doug Bowles, issued a proclamation, said my streak was still intact. So that's the asterisk on the front, but I'm going to take it. He said if you watched it on TV and with your family, you get it. I did exactly that. I'm going to claim it. In 2021, we were rewarded for not being able to see the race in person. Uh, Elio Castroneves passed um, for the lead on the second to last lap, won his fourth. And if you know anything about Elio, he climbs the fence at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He is called Spider-Man because of it. So he became the fourth four-time winner. There they are, A.J. Foyt, Ellinger Sr., Rocket Rick Mears, Elio Castroneves. But then they did some really cool safety in, in uh, okay, sorry, I want to give you the specs and then I'll give you the, the final safety component. So I know we're here for car talk, so I, I wanted to at least tell you what they're running, right? So Delara is an Italian um, chassis manufacturer. They are the only supplier to Indy. Um, again, because of that issue with the amount of investment that it required, they decided to go to a spec series so that entry was not a barrier. 
that if you had a reasonable amount of starting capital around $10 million, you could field a team. Um, each of the Dolores is about 350,000. They run 2.2 uh, liter dual overhead cams. Um, actually, I think now they're 2.4. Um, they do six speed paddle shifters. Um, they have to have reverse, even though on the, on the Indy 500, you wouldn't do that, but they also race on road courses. Um, they can weigh 1,650 pounds. Uh, in comparison, a, a stock car uh, that they race in NASCAR is uh, about 3,600 pounds, so they're light. Um, they can get up to about 750 horsepower plus 60 more horsepower. They have a button called push to pass. Gives them a little bit more uh, turbo boost, but they have a limited amount during the race and they can only use it for 10 seconds at a time. Uh, they run 100% ethanol. They have 18.5 US gallons of fuel. And importantly here, in Formula One, when they race, they fill up once. They don't put fuel in at pit, stop, at pit stops. Additionally, in Indy, you can only have four men over, five men over the wall. You can have two, uh, a tire changer on each wheel and someone to adjust the wing and tell them when to release. Even the jack man stays on the outside of the wall. Um, they have a combination of direct and indirect fuel injection. Um, and it produces uh, 300 uh, bar of pressure. Uh, I didn't put my parentheses on there, but that's about 4,300 PSI. Uh, Borg Warner provides the turbochargers. You recall Borg Warner? They're the, spot, they're the name on the trophy. Uh, they're, you know, um, 200 inches. Um, the wheelbase is uh, adjustable depending on if they're on uh, road courses or, uh, or, or ovals. So they race on roads, street, and ovals. Uh, the difference is road courses are permanent courses. Streets are when they go to a, a city and they change the, you know, they block off streets so they can race in there. That's really fun to watch. And then of course, ovals are really not ovals in particular, but that's what we call them. They're not actual ovals. They're more like tri-ovals or like, Indy's more like a rectangle or, uh, you know, a truncated rectangle. Uh, no power steering. Yeah, even on road courses. Um, for those of you who, who own older cars, you're like, ah, so what? But, you know, for the, all the other series, they have power steering. And then Firestone uh, is the only supplier right now. Uh, Goodyear's gonna come back on in just a little, uh, I think in two years. Um, importantly, Fire, uh, Firestone developed the run flat tire out of the heat that IndyCar tires um, experience because that's the barrier to run flat is the heat typically would melt them, but they've been able to use their tire uh, R&D at Indy. Um, oh yeah, uh, sorry, with the safer barrier, by the way, uh, it was first deployed at Indianapolis in 2002, anywhere, it's the first place that they did it. Indy tested that um, and, and worked alongside them. So then the other thing that they did was they developed an aero screen with PPG. Um, the aero screen is essentially a windshield that comes up and over, but it's not any windshield. It's got to withstand things hitting it at high speeds. This is Callum Eilat. That was part of the crankshaft. The car in front of him. He, he wasn't going that fast. He was going about maybe 140 then. You see it right there? Right there. Well, before the aero screen, there's some real question as to whether that driver walks away, right? So they keep improving, they keep improving. Because it's now a spec series, they don't improve in the technology of the cars so much. That's left up to Formula One where they will literally spend hundreds of millions of dollars to get a tenth of a second. Like it's, it's really that crazy. Um, 
but the safety innovations through IndyCar are still uh, incredibly impressive. Um, but, and then finally, I want to remember, remind everybody, it's, not, it's more than a race, right? I've been going to this for 40 years. This year will be my 41st. Um, those are my two brothers. It's my dad. He's been to 39 of the 40 with me. There was one year he just couldn't go. Um, he just didn't feel good, and he was glad. Uh, this is my, our brother by another mother, Brad Baldwin there. And, uh, and then finally, I got a long way to go. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I'm way down. Um, but I, uh, I do want to acknowledge my dad and my brothers. Um, and then Chris, of course, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and then the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum, because some of the, um, a number of the resources I used were available through them. And Chris and I have been doing some, some work with them as well. But uh, uh, that, there we go. Um, open for questions, anything I can answer. Yes, go ahead. Why did you become a Rick Mears fan at one race? Yeah, so I wanted the underdog. I wanted the underdog. He lost the closest race in history. And I thought, you know, that stinks for that guy. Um, and then another thing about watching Rick that, you know, I was younger then, they used to drive me crazy is he would sit in like, you know, he'd hang out somewhere between like eighth and fourth. He wouldn't really challenge for the lead. He, you know, he'd just kind of hang out in the middle of the pack, uh, you know, in the front pack. Um, and then years later, I saw an interview with him and he said, yeah, I did that intentionally. I didn't want to show anybody what I had. Well, I just sit back there and, you know, bide my time and stay out of trouble. And then in the last 20 laps, he would turn it on. Um, but that's how, that's why, because uh, I, I felt for the guy who lost the closest race in history. So uh, let me go here and then I'll come back. Go ahead. Uh, two questions. What is the aero screen made of? Yeah, great question. Which is the admission to... Oh, to get into the track? Okay, uh, good question. The aero screen is made of a polycarbonate material that's proprietary to PPG. Um, I can, it took about three years of development because there are other considerations, like what do you do in rain? Because they run, they run on rain, you know, uh, on road courses in the rain. Um, and then especially the biggest problem, and, and they used to have this in, in aircraft as well, is the distortion of the field of view based on the curve. So I, I couldn't tell you the exact polymer of the, uh, of the, the aero screen, um, but if you, if you look it up, you'll get all the specs. But it's a, yeah, it's a really great question. Um, and then to follow that up, Formula One doesn't have an aero screen. They have what's called a halo. So they've got this bar right in the middle and then a halo they also don't go on ovals. So it's a little bit different for them. But yeah, great question. It, it, it's been a, several drivers have had their lives saved since then. Admission fee? Oh, thank you. Uh, it depends on where you sit. Um, to get into the infield, I think it's 10 bucks on race day, nothing. Um, if you wanna actually see the cars going by, 80 bucks, yeah. I mean, our tickets are a little more because we sit. So where we sit is across from the third to last pit. This is important because the qualifying order lets you determine where your pit is. And you want to be at the end because then you can see everybody coming for you, right? And you know when you have to get out. So sitting there, we're in the shade, very important. Um, we get to see the best pit action, and I can't tell you how many times races have been won and lost in the pits, right? So remember earlier I said like, hey, if you're sitting in the pits, you know, for every second, it's about three football fields. Those seconds count. They really count. So if your pit crew messes up or you happen to leave without a wheel or which happened two years ago, um, well, last year, actually, Bobby, uh, um, Ray Hall, uh, not Bobby. I can't believe I don't remember his name right now. Graham, Graham Rahal. 
left, wheel just fell off his car, right? Go ahead. Do all cars have a camera? Yes, all of the cars have cameras. Um, one of the key innovations, well, many of the key innovations that have been, that have come out of the track are, are on that media side, as well as on timing and scoring as well. Um, you know, being car people, I didn't want to quite go into that element as much, but yeah, um, the, the original timing and scoring, uh, electronic timing and scoring was, was piloted at IMS, um, and each of the cars has a camera, and each of them has um, a steering wheel that, just the steering wheel is about $30,000, um, and they will pipe um, any of the, the, the lights. So if it goes yellow, they'll know immediately on their dash, um, and then they can all get directions via their uh, steering wheels. But yeah. And I'm guessing when you're going 250 mile an hour and you, you need to push the turbo button, or whatever that is. Just right here. Um, it's right here. It's right here. Right here. Everything's right here. Paddle shifters, all of it. Yep. Yeah, please. So I remember back in the late 80s, or early 90s, there was a controversy with like the horsepower that the cars could produce. Was that a result of the split? And is it still like limited? Oh, that was really. Uh, so what you're talking about is uh, Mercedes Benz and um, Roger Penske, who is who has more wins than any other team owner. He also now owns the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and IndyCar. Uh, he's not very wealthy. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. He, you've seen the Penske trucks around? That's Roger Penske. Um, so what they did was they, they took advantage of a loophole in the, in the specs, which was that if you had a stock engine that you could then generate more horsepower, you were allowed more horsepower if you used a stock engine. But the thing was, is that all the other, all the engine suppliers were supplying non-stock engines. But they partnered with Mercedes to create a stock engine that they would put in a couple of their production cars. And then when they got to the track, uh, it was Penske and everybody else. Uh, at the end of the race, there were only two cars on the lead lap and it was both Penske cars. It would have been three, but Emerson put his into the fence on lap 186. Um, but yes, uh, the next year, they did away with that rule, and no Penske cars qualified for the race. Go ahead. Just as an observation, I've been here twice years ago, and I went my first time with my dad. We got in line downtown Indianapolis at like 11 o'clock at night, and stayed in until you opened, because we stayed in the inside. And as a 14-year-old kid, I learned more about life on that street that night, had to pay 50 cents to use the bathroom, unbelievable. But when you get to the race, and inside, if you well know, half the people, when I was there, there's a, it's a big party. Yeah, yeah. But you can see the race so much better from the, the, the next time we went, we were in the stands, and all you do is, you know, see it. But I was there in 64 when Eddie Sachs. Yeah, yeah. When they had gasoline and they, it was a sad deal. They actually put it and they had that never took them out of the car. They lifted yep. it up. Talk about a, a sad point. Yep, yep. So again, yeah. I've seen it is the event. There's nothing like it, and you know. Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to, to end today by saying if you haven't been, go once. Just go once. Put it on your bucket list. It's something you should see. I mean, it really is. It's not like any other race you've ever been to. And I've been to races all over the country. I've been to Fontana, California. I go to St. Louis every year. I've been to Kentucky, to uh, Richmond. I I've been all over the place. Nothing like the Indy 500, just n not even a comparison. I've been to Daytona for the NASCAR races. Nothing like it. Go ahead. We have a local Manhattanite, Greg Solberg, that was a member of the L. Lenter racing team. Yeah, right on. Yeah, I, I, I haven't met him, but uh, yeah, um, the Unsers, they're just, yeah, they're the winningest family by far. They're incredible. Go ahead. You said something about you went 180 on there. How do you? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So thank you for asking. Yeah, they, uh, they have two seaters. So actually what was really neat was um, the, 
the day I went was two days after the race, and the guy who drove me was a guy named Charlie Kimball, who qualified 33rd that year, but importantly, he bumped a guy named Fernando Alonso, two-time world driving champion in Formula One, bumped him. He was the guy that was in the front seat when I was in the back. We went about 180, and I can tell you, first, everything goes flying by. And even at a place that big, where it's made to make it so it doesn't seem like that, it's fast. And then secondly, I just couldn't help but think that rear end was going to come around every time we went. Like, you just, it sticks to it. You, you, you know, I know that the driver knows what he's doing. He drove an extra 50 miles an hour or more. But it was super cool. And then finally, it took me quite some time to wipe the smile off my face. Like, I think I just walked around like this. Because it was, I mean, it was just incredible. Uh, yeah, it was very, very cool. But thank you for asking. Yeah, it's really neat. Anything else? Yeah, go ahead. Second question, what did that cost you? Uh, so they had a group on, and it was half off. So I think it was about 300 bucks. And you get, uh, you get four laps. You know, For me, after I've been to that many 500s, it was completely worth it. It's completely worth it. Um, I would do it every day and twice on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, I guess not Sunday, because they have other things going on on Sunday in May. Memorial yes, Memorial Day weekend, kind of. Kind of busy, yeah. All right, I really appreciate your time today. I hope you uh, learned a little something and yeah. Right.